this is week five. I probably think it's the hardest week of all of them. It is cardiac and respiratory. And it's not what you learn in the adult world. These are congenital heart defects. Although there are some things like congestive heart failure, which are very similar to the adult world. So you'll hear me say it's like adults, same medicine, like adults, but it's children. Remember when we give the same medicines, it's always milligrams or micrograms per kilogram. But just because you think they're adult medicines, they use these on the brand new little premature babies. So it can be used and used very safely, okay? So cardiac and respiratory, this week you do have your quiz number three, which is open and ready. You should be ready after class. I do try to cover all the topics in my lecture or my cahoots. So you'll um, look at the question and go, hmm, what did she say about that? And, and you'll be able to answer them. And then, of course, you have a discussion question, which is about asthma and um, a child having asthma and what they look like, et cetera. So respiratory distress is big, signs and symptoms, and we're gonna go over those things. So we're gonna start out with the PowerPoint tonight. So where did the PowerPoint go? Did you all get the matching cardiac um, and respiratory worksheet I sent to you? It was attached to exam one grades, and then there was an extra topic and I put it on the bottom. Did you all get it? If not, let me do something. Let me attach it to the chat just to be sure for y'all. And I want you to know that this is something I made up years ago for my students. And I did it as a guide to show you all the things that are very important to know. And here is the uh, worksheet that I give. I don't need it back. This is for you. This is for you to have in a neat, tight little place, all those big topics within these chapters. Okay, so it is a great tool for studying also, okay? So I put it in the chat for you. Hi, thank you, Professor. No, you're always welcome. Just ask, can you get it? So respiratory, we're gonna start there. So we know that respiratory has issues, whether it's in the lower or in the upper part of the lungs and respiratory tract. Upper respiratory is, you know, your oropharynx and your ears. That's all considered part of the mucus area. The lower extra, um, respiratory tract, we think of the bronchioles, we think of, you know, the wheezing and we think of pneumonias, you know, and asthma. Now, upper respiratory infections are mostly viruses. That's usually what we do see. Um, we've always heard of RSV and respiratory cynical virus. For you and me, that's a common cold. For the newborn, it creates a problem. And why? Well, newborns are obligatory nose breathers, which mean they have a mouth they could breathe out of, but they don't know how to do it. They're not coordinated yet. So sucking, swallowing, and breathing is pretty hard when your nose is clogged full of mucus. And that's what RSV does. And then a little low-grade fever. So RSV today, we do have a vaccine. It is a monthly vaccine, and it's called Synergist. And it's part of your matching um, list there that I just gave you. And it's something that we give to your autoimmune children, cardiac children, premature with respiratory issues, because just that little bit of blocking that airway could be too much for their bodies to handle because they're already really compromised, okay? So it is synergist and we give, and it's monthly from early fall to early spring. Those are the months that we usually give it. Now, you do get some bacterial type of pneumonias, but mostly we'll treat them like a virus. Now, we're gonna be going now into systems of the body and we're gonna talk about infections. And we know that pediatrics goes from 
newborn to age 21. So we need to know how does it affect that child. <clears throat> now, when babies are born, they're born with mommy's antibodies. So they're pretty okay. But remember, they haven't been in contact with all of these viruses. They haven't had a chance to build up their own anything. So they're pretty susceptible, but mom will take care of them for about three months, but it wears off, okay? Between three to six months, you're gonna see infants get sick with those, you know, running noses, upper respiratories, ear infections, because as they get these infections, now they're gonna build up those immunities. And we know as they get older, their immunity gets stronger and stronger by how many types they have viruses and ear infections and sore throats and you know all of this. It, the body is making its own immune system. By the time they get to be a toddler in a preschool, you know, you've heard me talk about it. This is the age of swapping spit. They go to daycare. They take a toy from one kid that's in his mouth, put it in their mouth. So they're swapping all their germs all around. And you're like, ooh, but let me tell you, what they're doing is they're preparing themselves to go to school. Their immune system is being built by all of these infections. You know, they've said before that put a toddler in daycare and they're sick every week. Yeah, they are because of this oral everything in the mouth, okay? But they are building their immune system. So you have to look at the bright side with this. And then after that, it becomes more of bacterial. Now, in the oral pharynx, everything's open. You can see it's shorter, open, straight. And when you have mucus, it's going to go where the area of least resistance. So it goes poof up into the ears, okay? Up in the nose, down the throat, dripping on the trachea. So understanding that everything's small, that's how come all of this stuff and mucus says, hmm, ears are a good place. That's why young kids have a lot of ear infections. Now, what do we need to look for? You know, children are all different. They all have different symptoms. And this is why I love working pediatrics. It's not like you have a, a gallbladder and they're all gonna look the same, all same symptoms, children don't. So in one child, you may see that anorexia, they're not eating even their favorite foods and maybe a fever. Maybe another kid has a fever with, they vomited once or their tummy hurts or they could have a cough and not eating. They will have something of combination of this. <clears throat> and then you're gonna say, mm, they're sick, especially when they're not eating their good foods. So if you see them in the corner, not playing right, take a temperature. Usually their temperature has gone up and you haven't realized it yet. So when we're dealing with respiratory, you know, what is our goal? We see what's going on. We treat them with Tylenol or Motrin or antibiotics or aerosols, whatever. But what do we want? What is our goal? Well, we want them to breathe easier. We want them to be able to rest. And we wanna to try to teach them how not to get their germs everywhere. But that's hard with kids, we know that. But if their temperature is down and we keep it down, alternating Tylenol and Motrin, we know that the temperature down on a kid is going to act normal. They're going to drink. They're going to eat. And we want to keep up that nutrition, especially that hydration. And we know parents, when children are sick, they might get their special ice pop they never get or that special juice they never drink, you know, to give them that comfort. And that's what kids look for. So I mentioned how all this mucus goes to that area of least resistance, which means going into the ears and otitis media. Well, what is otitis media? Well, this is what we call an inner ear infection. That eardrum gets full of mucus and bacteria and bulges and it hurts. I've seen kids hold their head and just be crying. You try to give them a hot pack or a cold pack. They don't want it. Don't touch, don't touch. It hurts, it hurts. So. Whenever I have a kid come in, I know it's an ear 
infection. First of all, I ask what ear. And even two-year-olds will point like that to their ear. And I think it's such a cute thing. First thing I'm gonna do is give them something for pain. That's my priority. Antibiotics aren't gonna help right away. It's gonna take several doses. So <clears throat> giving them Tylenol or Motrin is gonna ease the pain. And that's what I wanna see. Now, how do we treat ear infections? Well, an occasional ear infection is just gonna be antibiotics. It is a staph infection, your oropharynx is full. And if it goes to the ears, they will be treated with an antibiotic. So make sure those parents take the whole dose because chronic ear pain can cause hearing loss and then ear infections. So we really need to treat it. Now, sometimes all we do, they're still gonna continue with ear infections. You know, this is when you have four or five ear infections in a year and the doctor says, okay, we're gonna put tubes in. Now I had tubes put in a couple of years back and I went to the doctor's office and I wasn't sedated or anything. The hardest part is when he put this little tiny little suction thing and tried to suction out the mucus out of my middle ear. Oh my goodness. Could, could have tolerated it. It was loud and it was scary. It really was. So they do it under anesthesia, but it's a quick, quick procedure. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat is not too great tonight, sorry. Now, mononucleosis. Now, mononucleosis is the kissing disease. Usually you hear about adolescents kissing disease, the spreading of mono. Well. Mono is a virus. It's an Epstein-Barr virus. And when I mean Epstein-Barr, that makes you tired, lethargic, no energy, you're fatigued. <laughs> you have a little fever. You're going to have a sore throat. You're going to ache all over. Lymph nodes are up, you know. And these children go to the doctor and they'll say, okay, the swab for strep, negative. Uh, let's do a flu or COVID test, all negative. So they say, oh, you're a viral pharyngitis, Tylenol Motrin and you know, plenty of fluids and rest. Well, a couple of days later, they're not better. They go back and the doctor says, well, everything's negative, but let's try antibiotics. By about the sixth or seventh day, they go to the ER or the urgent care because the doctor don't know what he's doing. The kid's still sick. Antibiotic didn't work. So of course, the ER, the urgent care, know what to do. Well, when we hear the symptoms, what we'll say is, okay, let's draw some blood. And we're going to do a CBC and a monospot test. Well, the CBC is looking for white cells, seeing if there is an infection, right? <coughs> and then we do this monospot test. Most time it will come back positive with all of these signs and symptoms. So now it's our job to teach this patient, what is the outcome? Well, it's gonna take time. It's gonna go away by itself. It's a virus, Tylenol and Motrin for those aches and pains and fever, drink plenty of fluids. And then they're gonna tell you not to have PE or contact sports for a couple of weeks until you're seen by the pediatrician. You know, I had this little nine-year-old boy came to me, all those symptoms, he came with his dad. <clears throat> and I sent them home, the physician spoke with them and so did I, and I said, listen, you need to protect that belly. The liver and the spleen both can swell up. The spleen could be like a balloon, ready to pop if it's hit so hard, right? Please, if you have brothers, sisters, no rough housing, you can't do PE. If you're in softball, baseball, soccer, please. Nothing until you're seen by your pediatrician at least three weeks from now. So yes, I understand, I understand. One week later, I am the primary trauma nurse on duty at Nicholas Children's and I get a helicopter call, rescue. Nine-year-old boy fell off a trike off the back of the trike, his brother was driving and he fell on his belly. 
and you know he's in arrest. Brings him to the ER, and I look at the kid. I know exactly who he is. He had burst the spleen. The child died from mononucleosis. So we think it's such a kissing disease, right? Be careful. Make sure you teach these parents and the child that they need to protect their abdomen. No contact sports. No riding trikes in the Everglades, okay? Those things, um, that child's life could have been spared. I am still traumatized by that because why did I get him the first time and then get him as a trauma? I guess so that I could teach you all how important it is, right? So croup, croup is this barking, barking cough with inspiratory strider. You can't get air in. So it's on the way in and this bark, 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 okay? Now, it's a virus. It may or may not have a fever. But if we let it continue, the oral pharynx will get more and more swollen and you could end up with something called epiglottitis. Well, what is an epiglottis? That's that leaf-like structure which covers your trachea when you swallow so you don't aspirate, right? Well, when that epiglottis swells and epiglottitis, your airway is covered, the trachea is covered. How is air getting in? <laughs> Not much at all. So these children are bent forward tripod, almost like your elderly COPD patients trying to breathe, right? But they're drooling. They can't swallow. They are garbling when they talk like goo, 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 because it's so swollen back there. They don't swallow. You hear inspiratory strider. And if it prolongs, they're gonna go into hypoxemia and respiratory distress. When you realize it's epiglottitis, these children must be placed in an area that they can intubate or put a tracheostomy in. So how do we treat this? Well, it's swelling. How do we treat swelling? Well, we're yeah. gonna give, we're gonna start with nothing by mouth, right? Start an IV. We're going to give a racemic epi aerosol. It's epinephrine going directly to the throat in an aerosol mist. And then we're going to give some IV steroids. Now, usually that will decrease the swelling. They'll be able to breathe. But you've got to be prepared for the worst here, which is now try to intubate with the epiglottis is covering the airway. It's very difficult. Okay. I never had to intubate or do a trach on these kids. Now, croup, as I said, it's common. It's a virus. You know, these are those children at night who start sparking, barking, barking. You bring them out, you change the environment, and all of a sudden they're not coughing and you're bringing them to the ER. Well, we believe you, trust me. It's hard to have a kid coughing, coughing, and can't sleep. <clears throat> now, upper respiratory infections are usually preceding. They had a little cough, a little cold, a little mucus, and then all of a sudden you hear that inspiratory <gasps> as they breathe in, and then you're going to see some retractions, and then this cough isn't like my little cough. It is a bark. It is loud. When you hear it, you know it's croup. And as I said, if we allow it to continue, it's going to swell up more stuff. It's going to cause severe hypoxemia, and it will lead to acidosis and respiratory failure. So whenever there's an airway problem, number one, we maintain an airway, whichever way we can. Now, as it goes along, of course, we need to maintain hydration. Now, some crew kids haven't gone too far. They still can drink. They can even take their steroids, their prednisolone alone by mouth. But there's some kids that get so far and they can't barely breathe and really severe inspiratory strider. Those children will start an IV. We'll give IV steroids. We're also going to give them some sort of nebulized mist with supplemental oxygen. Why do we give oxygen? To stop hypoxemia. That's it. Nothing else. 
we're going to give them oxygen so they're not hypoxic, period. I mean, there's all sorts of things. Well, we do this and that. Well, we stop all that. Um, we give high, the oxygen. The hypoxia is de, you know, decreased. Then they're not as restless. They're not as anxious. It all works, but it's because we elevated the oxygen level in that child. And as I said, we're giving epinephrine in that little aerosol, and we're going to be given steroids, whether PO or IV. Now, I've mentioned RSV already, and it's that respiratory cynical virus. As I said, it's winter to early spring, late fall, early spring. And again, we give synergist for it. Nursing care of RSV. Well, it's a lot of mucus in the nose. Well, we're going to be doing a lot of teaching. Most of these children do go home and we tell them suction the nose, that little blue bulb that's all they need, or little nose Frida, where it's a little machine that sucks out nose um, that you buy at any CVS, Walgreens, whatever, before they eat. Don't do it too much because then it will produce more secretions. So get it out and let the child eat and give the child plenty of time to eat. And then the children do good. And it's usually for a couple of days. You know, I just had a, another granddaughter, my first granddaughter last Monday. And on Tuesday, we found out that the grandson who lives at the house <laughs> had RSV. So you know what we had to do? We had to do some uh, isolation of the baby when he came home. Pneumonias. Now, pneumonias are a consolidation in the lungs. And usually they come in with a fever, a cough, and they might have vomited. <coughs> <coughs> you know, when they vomit, it's usually a lot of mucus that comes up. These children will be getting antibiotics. They need to drink plenty of fluids and they need to watch their fever, keep the fevers down so they can eat and drink. Now, most of all with pneumonias, we'll treat them with antibiotics, but it can be viral. But we're not gonna mess around with the lungs and breathing and airway. So we do give antibiotics. As they get older, you're gonna see more of the mycoplasma, not the younger kids, but after they get into school. And they do now have a pneumococcal vaccine because that's the worst of all the pneumonias. It takes more out of the children. Now, pertussis, we give that immunization, right? Well, there has been quite a few outbursts of pertussis around the United States. Right before I left um, the hospital, they had a big outbreak the uh, fall before in Broward and Dade County, which is very close to here. And this pertussis is extremely contagious. I mean, it goes from kid to kid to kid. It is in the air, it's all airborne. So yes, there are immunizations to prevent it, but not all parents believe in immunizations for whatever reason. I just wanna know which child's not immunized so I can wear a mask when I'm taking care of them, right? You gotta be taking care of yourself or you can't take care of the other kids, which is I don't wanna spread from child to child. So I'll protect me to protect the other children because I don't have just one kid when I'm a nurse. I have four or I have six. So you gotta be very careful. The thing with pertussis, they give an antibiotic, they give azithromycin. Um, if they're admitted, they have to be in one of those reverse airflow rooms, which means the air from the room goes outside. It's not recirculated back in the hospital, okay? And yes, there's vaccines if they'll take it. <clears throat> well, we know children put everything in their mouths, beads, paper clips, uh, cars, um, hot dogs, sometimes pieces are too big, peanuts, popcorn, marbles, all sorts of stuff. Probably the most I've ever seen is coins. And it's not the dime or the penny, it's the quarter. And you see that picture there, that is a quarter sitting right in the child's throat. So what do we do? Well, once we see that, you know, the mother said, yeah, he swallowed a coin. What we're gonna do is of course, watch the airway 
Usually they can't swallow, it hurts, they're spitting out. Okay, get an x-ray, we see where it's at, and the surgeon comes. And the surgeon puts the child on the lap. And this is how we take care of it today. It used to be an OR bronchoscopy, go in with a clip, pull it out, would be an overnight stay and more dramatic, right? Today, no. They take a Foley catheter, put it down the mouth below the coin, blow up the balloon, lean the child forward and pull it out. The kid will vomit mucus, the coin will come out. Now, how do I get that kid to sit there? Well, I say, listen, when that coin comes out and falls on the floor, if I get it first, it's mine. So the Foley catheter comes out, they vomit, it retches, the coin falls, the kid jumps on the floor and oh, you beat me. They didn't think about it hurting, did they? So again, distraction really, really helps in this situation. And I'm telling you, the parents look at me and say, thank you, because they're not as concerned. And we leave the parents in the room too. And then afterwards, of course, we monitor them for a while for airway. Now there's other things we can aspirate. Um, food, children have reflux. They get you know, formula or breast milk up into their lungs. So what do we do? How do we prevent aspiration on children? Well, they can't be overfed. We need to burp them well. They should be sitting up for at least half an hour after they feed. And then sometimes if they're having a lot of reflux, we put a little bit of rice cereal whether it's the breastfed, we'll feed them a little cereal and then breastfeed them. Or if they're formula fed, put it in the bottle. Now they get no nutritional benefit, the young kids, because you don't feed them till six months old, right? Yes, you'll see it in the stool, but it thickens the milk. So it sits down and you have less aspiration. And then the other way you get aspiration is that wonderful Johnson & Johnson baby powder. I mean, the smell is amazing, but the talcum in the air can really affect children. You know, years ago, we used it in the newborn ICU. We realized, oops, we did wrong, so we don't do it anymore. Another respiratory illness is what we call an acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. And this is when the lungs are hurt somehow, some way. And this child is sick, really sick. Now in South Florida, I think the biggest thing that we see is the near drowning. <laughs> the thing with drowning is sometimes you get there, the ambulance, the kids running around the pool or the beach or whatever, and they look good. The thing is up to 72 hours later, they could start with respiratory distress. You know, the other things we see is overwhelming sepsis. Uh, what if they had trauma, car accident to the chest? And then of course, adolescents, more adolescents than other age uh, children, drug overdoses, but it requires a lot of intensive nursing care. This is a picture of ECMO. And I actually um, used to run the machine and it's basically, it pulls blood out, you oxygenate it and you put it back in the child. So when the lungs can't oxygenate the child, we have a machine that does it until they start to get their lungs fixed and heal, gives them a chance to heal. And then we turn the machine down slowly and then we pull it off. So these kids are sick. A lot of them die. Okay, that's a rough thing, ARDS. Now, CPR, we all have CPR, right? I think I've taken it uh, about 44 times already. I think I know CPR. <laughs> I've been an instructor before, <clears throat> way back in my career. But how do we treat family? Now, I think the hardest time is you get a child in wherever area, and the child is going through a code blue and you have parents. Now, many hospitals don't want the parents in the room, but can you imagine being a parent wanting to hold that child's hand? What if they die? 
They wanted to be the last person to kiss them, make sure that they were taken care of. So if we can, leave them in the room. If we can't, make sure, <coughs> excuse me, someone's there. Make sure a nurse is with them. And of course, continuous updates during the code and then have a doctor talk to them. Now, we know CPR should be done to protocol. I'm gonna give you an example of CPR. You need to review it. And what do you do for certain situations? What if you walk into a child's room and they're, they're not on monitors, they're on a regular room. You find them on the floor, unconscious, not breathing. What do you do first? Assess them. CPR, you start chest compressions. Because that's going to get what the oxygen is left in the body is going to move it around. Okay. And then they say after three cycles, go get help. So the first thing, start chest compressions. You know, years ago, they used to say, give two big breaths and then start chest compressions. But today they think there's enough oxygen left, you know, in the body. So just start uh, chest compressions. <clears throat> now, asthma is probably one of the most common childhood illnesses. And it's about something that causes the lungs to be hyper responsive. And it's an irritation. There's swelling and it causes a cough, 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 cough. It causes uh, expiratory wheezing, prolonged expiratory phase of breathing. You can breathe in, but it's hard to get it back out because it swells up in there. So you can't get it out. And usually at the end of a breath, you'll hear like a, like a wheeze. You almost can hear it audibly. So once we determine a child is asthmatic, we need to see how are the lungs working? you know, pulmonary functions when they're doing good. We got to see what allergens are they allergic to? Is it grass? Is it trees? Is it um, bed bugs? Is it cats, dogs? What is it? You know, to try to keep them away or try to get them desensitized. <clears throat> Kids with asthma, we try to keep them as normal as possible, but if they're allergic to grass, they shouldn't be out playing soccer, right? They should maybe do another sport, try to help them until they're ready. And we always try to prevent them from having attacks. You know, a couple of years back, my husband had status asthmaticus. It lasted 12 days. He was in the ICU and he could not breathe. And he had a little bit of air moving in his lungs. And it was at the end of an expiration. And it was like, and that was it no air moving and it was scary. So we do everything now to prevent that <laughs> from going on. And we would do that, you know, with children too. We give those long-term control medications. You know, in adult world, you see Simbacor and um, Advair, Brio, it's morning and night. And that's preventive. That's not for rescue. We know we have albuterol, provental, you know, that's for, I can't breathe. I need help now, right? And then as we're having these asthma type situations, they will be giving us steroids, whether orally or if we need, and they can't really breathe, you know, corticosteroids, you know, intravenously. <coughs> All right, cardiac. Now, when you think of cardiac, I want you to think about blood flow being a garden hose. And if you kink it, where does the blood go? It goes back, right? So knowing how blood flows through the heart and the body is going to help you understand cardiac more. So congenital heart defects, they're born with it. 
there's many. I'm going to go into them. Acquired could be an infection. It could be a viral infection that affects the heart. Autoimmune, well, lupus, right? It affects all organs. It can affect the heart. Environmental, some sort of chemical spill, right? And it could be in the family. <clears throat> now, here is the way blood flows. Do you know where the valves are? Do you know where the chambers are? You don't, you need to go back and look, okay? It goes from the vena cava, superior, inferior, inferior to the right atrium. The valve between that is the tricuspid valve, goes into the right ventricle, up the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Comes back to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins, goes through the mitral valve, left ventricle, aortic valve to the aorta to the body. That's the way blood flows. The unoxygenated gets oxygenated and then goes to the body. That is normal. I'm gonna give you something. Take that little aorta that's coming off the heart. Yeah, those three little things that go up, the carotid subclavians that go up to the head, right? Let's go past that and let's kink it. Let's narrow it. Let's make it a, um, a kink called a coarctation of the aorta. It's kinked. That means blood can't flow down. What are you gonna see? And newborns are born like this. That's why we look at pulses when an infant is born, right? If you see decreased pulses in the lower extremities, something's happening. Or no pulses in the lower extremities, blood's not going there. Where's the blood going? Well, it may be going to the upper part of the body. So do a four extremity blood pressure. The lower extremities will have a lower blood pressure. Blood's not going there. It's going to be lower. And if you go up, the blood's up there more, you're going to see a higher blood pressure. Now, sometimes these kids get older and we don't see it. Yeah, they complain of colder feet, whatever, but it's never been enough. Then all of a sudden they get headaches, blood flows going up to the head, right? Not to the bottom. And they get nosebleeds, epistaxis. That's sometimes when they find it. So think of a garden hose. It's kinked. It can't go down. It's going to go to the upper body. It's also going to go back into the heart. And it goes to the left ventricle, left atrium, and it goes back to the lungs if we let it sit too long. And then the lungs fill up. I actually saw a little girl, coarctation, came in. She was three months old. They didn't find it. Nobody understood what was happening. And by the time she got to us, she was in congestive heart failure. Her heart was stretched because of that kink. That left ventricle got stretched because the blood had to go somewhere. It went back and then it went up into the lungs. By the way, she did well, but it took her a while to shape her up. <coughs> so sometimes, how do we know if it's a cardiovascular problem? Well, these kids don't eat well. You know why? There's, they're not getting oxygen. They don't have activity tolerance. They tire easily. They don't eat. Therefore, they're not getting nutrition. Therefore, they're not gaining weight. Cognitive developmental delay is part of it because they're not getting enough because they're tired. You don't get oxygen. Are you going to eat right? No. So this is something that we do see. When we do an assessment, you know, we always look at how are they eating? How much? We look at the color. I mean, if a baby is blue cyanotic, that's easy. Coarctation or not blue. They're fully saturated. 
it's just decreased pulses, okay? And then if it's prolonged, yes, congestive failure. You know, I'll ask you a question with congestive heart failure. When we start to see all of this fluid retaining, what's one of the symptoms you might see? The urinary output's gonna decrease because it's filling up in the lungs. They're gonna be gaining weight. Their weights are gonna be going up, right? Their intake's gonna be more than their output, part of congestive heart failure. And that could be related also to adults. We're gonna look at their chest, listen for murmurs. I mean, as they get older, it's the clubbing of fingers. And I have a picture of that later. You know, feeling the pulses, the heart rate. I mean, if your normal heart rate is 140 to 160 and it's 184 and the baby's sleeping, something's going on. The heart's trying to work hard, okay? So we'll be looking what's happening. So we suspect cardiac. Of course, we're gonna do an EKG. Look at that for any cardiac dysrhythmias. And then we're gonna do an echocardiogram. Now, once you do an echocardiogram, you see anything, be prepared, you're gonna do a cardiac cath. And the cardiac cath goes in with dyes and it looks at blood flow and we can make a determinate um, diagnosis, exactly what's going on and what, if any, surgery needs to be done. That's a diagnostic cardiac cath. You know, interventionals are one where, you know, Nicholas Children does something called a helix device. And it's something that we do instead of surgery, we can close a simple ASD or a VSD all between the chambers of the upper or lower chamber. And it's just little plates and it goes in and one goes on one side and it holds the, the hole so you don't have blood flow going on. And that's an interventional. Now, congenital heart defects, there's more than I ever thought. You know, Down's children are more susceptible of all children. If you have a child that you think could be Down's, you know, we need to look. And most common is a VSD but there could be other sort of things. So there are two sort of heart defects. You know, there's one that blood flows around and there goes to the lungs, it goes to the body. There might be a hole somewhere or something, but the heart still flows. There are other ones where the blood doesn't go to the lungs the way it should. And because of that, your O2 saturations in some cases are as low as 75%. Can you imagine O2 saturations of 75? I mean, not 100, not 90, 75. And that's acceptable in some cases. So if you don't have a big O2 saturation, you are going to be more uh, apt not to eat properly, tire easily, and be smaller in weight, right? So ASD, VSD are two of these um, type of acyanotic, that means you're fully saturated. But because the hole makes the left side flow back into the right side, it goes back into the lungs. It's increased pulmonary blood flow. Makes sense, right? If it goes from the left side back to the right side, back into the lungs, that's more flow to the lungs. Now, at birth and in fetal circulation, we have something called a PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. You heard of fetal circulation in OB, and it's how blood flows you know, when the baby's interutero. Well, <coughs> this PDA closes at birth usually or a couple of days after. Sometimes if you don't have blood flow, we need to keep it open so that blood can be oxygenated and given it to the baby. 
So there are two medicines that you need to know. The patent ductus arteriosus connects the lungs to the body, pulmonary artery to the aorta. So the lungs can put oxygen right into the aorta and that goes to the body, okay? Now, if we need to keep that open, normally mommy has this hormone called prostaglandins and it keeps that duct open. Well, mommy's gone now, the baby's born. So we can give a slow, continuous infusion of synth synthetic prostaglandins and keep it open. So if we wanna keep it open, we give prostaglandins. And let's say it keeps open for whatever reason and we need to close it, we need to stop wherever those prostaglandins are coming from that keeps it open. And we need to say, hey, stop, that's enough. And it's called endomethacin. Both of these are on your matching sheet. Prostaglandins, endomethacin, one opens, keeps it open, one closes it. You're gonna see some words like stenosis and atresia. What is a stenosis? It's a narrowing of a hole, right? So there's aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis. All of these means it's just tiny. That means it can't get through the way it should. But then there's something called atresia. Atresia means there's nothing. The most common of all atresias is between the right atrium and right ventricle called tricuspid atresia. So there's no blood flow going to the right ventricle. Well, what is in the right ventricle? The pulmonary artery, right? So blood goes to the lungs. So is blood going to the lungs? No. We need that patent ductus arteriosus, right? We need oxygen, so that will give us oxygen. That's one of the cases why we need it. Now, tetralogy of Polo is the most common of all your congenital heart defects. The tetralogy of Fallot is the one diagnosis in congenital heart defects you'll see on HESIs, quizzes, exams, NCLEX loves tetralogy of Fallot. So this is the one diagnosis that you need to look at. Open your book, look at it, see the way blood flows. But very simply, ever hear of a blue spell or a tet spell? A kid all of a sudden turns blue? Well, this is Tetralogy of Fallot. And very simply, that pulmonary artery spasms or a piece of tissue covers it and blood can't go to the lungs. And it's like, not all the time, it's like intermittently, and maybe once or maybe 10 times. And you can see O2 saturations go from 100 to 10 in 30 seconds. It happened to me. Little Mr. Nolan did it to me. So what do we do? What is the treatment? Well, we gotta get oxygen there quick, right? So we take this child, take the knees and the chest, and push them together quickly. What does that do? Well, it takes the abdominal pressure and the chest pressure and it changes it and it pops open what's ever covering that pulmonary artery and lets blood flow again. It requires surgery. Some do it at infants, you know, uh, younger infants. Sometimes they're not done till later on, two or three years old. And these children have tet spells and by themselves, they just drop to the, and sit on their feet, like a squat, they call it. And what does it do? It's just like any chest. It changes the pressure in their abdomen and in their chest. I think it's pretty cool they do it by themselves. The other big diagnosis is transposition of the great arteries. And this again is cyanotic. Your aorta is where the pulmonary artery should be. 
and the pulmonary artery is where the aorta should be, which means there's no oxygen to the body. How do we take care of no oxygen? The PDA, the patent ductus arteriosus. This child is started on prostaglandins and it gives us a, sometimes a week, 10 days to do surgery because they're getting oxygen. So this is a lot. This is something you gotta look at and think about, okay? There's a couple slides here that I left for you that shows blood flows for you to look at. Now we sort of mentioned a little bit about congestive heart failure. Um, sometimes it's just because the heart is weak. It's trying so hard, it just can't pump. So fluid builds up. Usually it's more left-sided. So it goes up into the lungs and it fills up the fluid into the lungs. So what do we do for congestive heart failure? Well, we're gonna take an X-ray and look at it. And it's gonna be full of all the fluid. So what do we need to do? Well, we want the heart to beat better and we wanna get rid of that fluid. We want the child to breathe easier, right? These children will be placed on furosemide, just like adults, 0.1 milligram per kilogram. They'll be placed on digoxin. And this is mics per kilo. They'll be watching them doing strict intake output. And they will be daily weights looking at them. And we know sometimes the first hint they're going into failure is they're not going to have the output they used to. It's going somewhere. And we're also going to see a weight gain. And while they're on this congestive heart failure, with all this fluid, they'll be placing them on oxygen. And again, it's only to relieve the hypoxemia. So exactly what I just said. Now, as we're doing this and seeing this, our jobs as nurses teach the parents. Let them know what's going on, what you have to do, because a cardiac child could go, go into congestive failure at home, right? And if they're seeing changes, they can see them quick. So we teach them all this stuff. <clears throat> As I said, hypoxemia could cause clubbing of fingers, especially in your older children. And there are cyanotic heart diseases that the best they ever get is 90% O2 saturations after three stages of surgery. So you will have children with clubbing of fingers. Now, the one concept here that you should understand is polycythemia. And polycythemia is when your hemoglobin and hematocrit get really, really, really high. And that's usually because of hypoxemia. Why? Well, the body says, you know, I don't have enough oxygen, so let me make some more red blood cells. Well, there's still no more oxygen, but it keeps trying making red blood cells. So your hemoglobin and hematocrit might be 18 and 54. I mean, it should be like 14, 52. I mean, this is really, really high. And that's called polycythemia. It's when the blood gets so rich with red blood cells and hemoglobin and hematocrit because it's trying to compensate for no oxygen. <clears throat> so as nurses, you know, cardiac parents are probably some of the nicest ones you'll meet. You know, I did 10 years in the cardiac ICU, you know, at Nicholas. And, you know, I opened the unit when Dr. Burke came there, who's from Harvard, an amazing, amazing a surgeon, uh, loved working with him. And these families, the whole point of my whole day was teaching them. And having them being aware of what's going on, being aware of what they're going to see, what their outcomes, what are you going to see by the end of this day, that day, and getting them ready to go home. You know, these children are just, I mean, so wanted and so loved, and they've got some of these really horrible cardiac diseases. I mean, they're very near and dear to all the nurses who take care of them. You know, we become parts of their family 
They really do. I mean, 20 years later, I still speak to some of these parents, you know, and some of these children have died and they're still in contact with me. <laughs> Endocarditis, just like adults, we're gonna give prophylaxis before treatments. Now in pediatrics, you're gonna see two diseases that uh, can be caused because of an under or not treated strep infection. And if you don't take all the antibiotics, it can attack your heart valves. And that could be permanent, but it also does, it uh, affects the joints, skin, brain, heart. And it also, um, where these things can affect, it's called chorea. It's like a really uh, gait, wobbly, and they're falling. And you bring these child to the doctor and they say, well, have you had a sore throat in the last couple of months? And you go, oh yeah, he had a little sore throat, but yeah, it went away. Well, it could have been a strep throat. And now they're having all these symptoms, rheumatic fever. How do we treat it? We treat the strep. It'll be at least a month long treatment of antibiotics, if not longer. And everything, all these symptoms will turn around and go away, except if that heart valve was damaged, that will not be, you know, turned back. Children can have high cholesterol. How do we treat them? Just like adults. We're gonna put them on a diet, watch their fats. And if that don't work, we're gonna put them on medications. <coughs> <coughs> They can have high heart rates, low heart rates, regular heart rates, just like adults. And we actually treat them the same. Brady dysrhythmias, I've seen two-year-olds with pacemakers because their hearts were beating too slow. It can happen. It's okay. Um, and we try to correct it just like adults. Pulmonary artery hypertension is when the lungs have been too much flows gone there and they say, oh, I, I had enough and they tighten up and they don't open as easily anymore. So it becomes difficult to breathe. So they get short of breath. They can get that chest pain and dizzy because of lack of oxygen. Now, this is something that we can treat and the first treatment is actually oxygen. What does oxygen do? It's a pulmonary vasodilator. So a little bit of oxygen. These children will have, you know, a nasal cannula that they'll have to have. And then the other medicine that I saw used, just to let you know, I saw Viagra used for children with pulmonary artery hypertension. It dilates the pulmonary vasculature and lets them breathe. I thought that was the neatest thing when I saw that. As I said, the heart can be damaged by infection, even viral. It gets big and floppy and it doesn't work and they need to come in, get medications. It's due to all different reasons. And then it gets to the point where the heart don't work. And that's when they get a transplant. The biggest problem in the first six months after transplant is rejection. These patients will be on immunosuppressive drugs for life because the, it's not the body's heart. They have to say, it's okay, leave the heart there, don't bother it. And you know, we didn't always check the younger children's blood pressures, but now we do, ages two and up absolutely will be checked. And we have found young children with problems with their blood pressure. So um, we are checking that closer. How do we treat it? Same thing, low salt diet and all those medications, but milligrams per kilogram for children. Now, Kawasaki disease is a kid's disease. These children look like they have a fever. Uh, they don't feel good. They get a rash. Uh, their eyes turn red. Their hands get peeling or blistered. 
Sometimes their tongue looks like a strawberry and it goes on and on and they can't diagnose it. And then all of a sudden somebody goes, oh, those hands are peeling good. The soles of the feet are, this is Kawasaki. Well, what does that mean? You know, Kawasaki is a motorcycle, okay? But Kawasaki here has nothing to do with a motorcycle. <laughs> it is called systemic vasculitis. The vessels get little swollen and little microembolies are, you know, spewed from the vessels in the body. They're mostly concerned about those coronary arteries because then of course you can have a myocardial infarction, right? All those little microembolus could block coronary artery and that's a cardi uh, myocardial infarction. Also, it can cause an aneurysm. So how do we treat Kawasaki? These are all the signs and symptoms and they are great pictures to show it to you. We give aspirin. The only time we give aspirin to a child, why? to prevent clots. It's also an anti-inflammatory. This is an itis, a vascular itis. So it decreases inflammation, it decreases the chance of clots, and then we give IVIG, intravenous gamma globins, which will boost the immune system. It is not a bacterial, okay? I saw it once. The first time was the director of the cardiac ICU son. And of course he came in on the nighttime where I was working, my patient. And it's where I, I learned what Kawasaki was. I didn't know what it was before then. I mean, I never heard of it. Well, I learned really quick. Shock, doesn't matter if you're an adult or a child, what do you see? blood pressure drops, heart rate goes up, capillary refill gets prolonged, urinary output decreases, right? Then you have, of course, this, you know, mentation, you're not going to be as alert because oxygen isn't there. There's all sorts of shocks. In children, the most common, septic shock, infection. Children, I mean, think about it. They don't have the immune system. So an infection is the biggest shock in children. Okay, surgical closure of the PDA would do what? Well, PDA does what? It oxygenates, right? It oxygenates the, from the lungs to the aorta. So if we clamp that off and close it, it's gonna prevent any blood from going back. Prevents return of oxygenated blood to the lungs. Makes sense. I'm telling you, this is a really rough week. There's a lot of information. Um, it's really hard. If anybody has any, you know, questions, let me know. I'll get with you and I'll discuss it more. I'll draw pictures for you. I have a whiteboard. I can do that. It is hard and I get it. I'm going to do the cahoots now. Who wants to win? Is it Amber tonight? Okay, Ulysses, okay. Crystal, you're gonna win, right? <laughs> you know, so far, of course, the quiz Julia. this week, what chapters is the quiz on? <laughs> this stuff right here, this stuff, 40 and 42. Thank you. And I made sure. All right, there are 56 questions. So let's see how we can do. Good luck, everybody. This Hi, um, Professor, you need some tea. You know, you know what it is? It's my RA. It's affecting my vocal cords. <clears throat> but thank you. I'm gonna have my husband make me some ginger tea with honey. I was just about to say that. Where is he? He normally <laughs> just sneaks in like in the background with a mug or yes, something, he, just puts he, it down and skedaddles right back out. I was like, where is that wonderful man? He is wonderful. 
I'm blessed. I really am. <clears throat> All right, let's get going. Week five, respiratory cardiac. Rough week, but I think this cahoots really covers it. A majority of upper respiratory infections are caused by what? <clears throat> so upper respiratory mostly are viral. That's why you go to the doctor's office. They don't give you antibiotics until you go back three or four days later, and then they will. You walk into a six-year-old child's room, you find them not breathing and doesn't wake up. What do you do first? And this is just knowing your CPR. Start chest compressions. That's first. You know, years ago, they wanted you to, you know, do mouth to mouth. And many people didn't. And many people died because of that. So they did research and found out there's enough oxygen in the blood just to do chest compressions without a mouth to mouth and people survived that way. That's why that changed. A multi-select. What are some signs and symptoms that smaller children may exhibit that have a respiratory infection? All the above, right? Could be fever, vomiting, cough, sore throat, poor appetite, abdominal pain. But I know children, the first thing you'll see is they stop eating. And you'll see them just go in the corner and don't want to be bothered. And then I'm going to be looking, <laughs> something not right here. Another multi-select. What do you look for when assessing respiratory function? Do you do in your assessment on this child? How fast are they breathing? How deep is it? Or is it shallow labored? And is it easy or not? All of those things make a difference. What would you look for after a child has a tonsillectomy? You know, upper airway includes tonsils and ears. So this is part of this chapter. <clears throat> you know, I had one girl come back seven days post tonsillectomy, right after seen by the ENT, and she was spitting up mega clots of blood. So much, I had to run her into the trauma room and give her a liter of fluid. She was six years old. She had to go to the OR and she had to have it recauterized. That's how serious a tonsil can be. So they need to rest. They need to relax. You know, up to two weeks afterwards, it can happen. Now, if they're swallowing, there's blood. So when you see them swallow, swallow, swallow. Now, don't open the mouth. Don't look. Don't prod in there. But, you know, just even just a little bit, you'll see blood there. And if they're bleeding, they probably need to go to the doctor and have it cauterized. They should not be bleeding. And I'm telling you, it can get bad. Multi-select. Nursing care for a child status post tonsillectomy include what? As in, what are you going to teach these parents? Because all of them go home today. <clears throat> Rarely do you have one who's in the hospital. My phone turned off. I don't have the code now, now to log in back. I'll give it to you. So it's on the bottom. If you see 9336. Yeah, I saw it. Thank you. 9336845. Yes, thank you so much, guys. So 
we want to give pain medicine. And, you know, Tylenol works really great for tonsillectomies. They used to give codeine, but they found children were overdosing on it because they really don't need it. Tylenol is really good as long as they keep up with it. Soft diet, so it doesn't irritate the throat. Absolutely no citrus, no spicy, because that hurts. And then young children don't like it, but an ice bag does help with discomfort. And of course, have the head of the bed up just a little bit, have them sitting up on two pillows. It helps with breathing. Multi-select. What would you suspect if a child has a dry, bothersome cough that keeps them awake at night? You know, the key word is dry here. And then at night. It's dry and it's at night. And this is your bronchitis. This is bronchitis, tracheobronchitis. Asthma is any time of the day or night. It, it's not specific. And pneumonia, remember, there are secretions that are lodged in the lungs. It is moist. You're trying to expectorate whatever that mucus is. So bronchitis, or the other name of it, tracheobronchitis, is that dry, bothersome cough. If you've ever had it, the doctor puts you on a Z pack. And we'll give you a coating cough medicine for nighttime to help you sleep because it will keep you awake all night. Multi-select. What signs and symptoms would you see in a child with otitis media? So they do have ear pain, that's for sure. And if they're younger, remember, they're going to be banging their head or touching their head with their hand, something. You're going to know it's an ear. Again, any kid who's sick is not going to eat. Us adults, we're going to eat no matter what. Children, no, they stop. And of course, if you see the dripping of serosanguinous or any sort of debris, we know it's ruptured by that point. They don't always have a fever. Sometimes there is, sometimes there's not. It is not always a fever with the ears. <clears throat> the monthly immunization for RSV is what? <clears throat> and it's called Synergist, and the other name, um, the generic is Palvizumab, it's a biologic. And again, it's monthly from fall to early spring. And this is given to those children immunosuppressed, cardiac children, premature children. There has to be a reason why. Normal, healthy newborns don't need it. Normal, healthy young infants. And it's for the first year of life. All of the following are signs of early respiratory distress in children, except... <clears throat> You know, when you have a kid who is in respiratory distress, they're tachypnic, they're tachycardic, diaphoretic, and they're getting restless. If they're to the point of being bradycardic, they are almost ready to be intubated. They're going into respiratory arrest, okay? One of the things you see with infants when they're in respiratory distress is, yes, all the above, but you'll see nasal flaring. You can see it. And also grunting, which is, means what? At the end of a breath, they go, eh, eh, eh. You hear an infant grunting and nasal flaring. 
get that kid to the trauma room because that kid needs help right now. That kid is about also to arrest on you. Grunting an infant is very, very dangerous. A four-year-old has been taking meds for the asthma and they're still wheezing. What information is important? <coughs> like, why are they still wheezing if they've been taking their meds? <clears throat> you know, giving them their medicine for their asthma, especially their rescue, not every child to three years old can puff and inhale at the same time, right? Like an adult. There's adults who can't do it. So there's this little tube called a spacer with a little mask and you puff whatever the dose is, two puffs, and let them breathe in and out four or five times. If they're crying, it's actually gonna go deeper and it will get into the lungs. So if they're still wheezing, so how did the child take their medicine? Did they take an MDI, the meter dose inhaler, or an aerosol, how did they take it? because probably it was without that spacer. And we could save a lot of things by saying, okay, let me give you a dose with a spacer and see what happens. An eight month old with croup exhibits what signs and symptoms of respiratory distress? <coughs> So we're going to see those retractions and restlessness. Remember, in croup, it's inspiratory strider. They can have a hard time getting it in, okay? In asthma, it's that prolonged expiratory phase because they can't get it out. That's the difference between the two. Signs and symptoms of asthma include all except... They're going to be hacking and coughing. That's usually the first thing you see in asthma. They're short of breath. They're wheezing. But remember, prolonged expiratory phase. It's not short, okay? Signs and symptoms of congenital heart disease include all except <clears throat> that a baby has congenital heart disease. What? What are you going to see? What aren't you going to see? So we know their weight gain is not going to be appropriate because they're not with good oxygenation. They're going to tire easily because not enough oxygen and they're going to not get enough nutrition and they're going to not gain weight the way they should. They will be in your 25 percentiles. They won't be in your 100 percentiles of weight gain. Mm -mm. What you should you not do to children diagnosed with croup and epiglottitis? So when you have any inflammation in the oral airway, you don't want to look into that mouth, okay? The only person who should is a physician who has the ability to intubate because you could create more swelling there. The epiglottis is what?
So again, the epiglottis is that leaf-like cartilage. It covers the trachea when you swallow so that food don't go in your lungs, it's all the above. And when that swells, it's covering the trachea. Guess what? You're not breathing. Treatment for infectious mononucleosis is what? What's the number one? Kissing disease, right? <laughs> no contact sports. Remember that spleen, big balloon is going to explode and you're going to die. So again, making sure we teach these parents not to let them in PE until they're cleared by their pediatricians. A multi-select. When doing an admission on an infant with a low-grade fever and loose cough, what information is important? You know, when you're doing an admission, you need to make sure infants are placed in the correct room, and you need to know how to take care of them the best way possible. What do you need to really know about here? <clears throat> So number one, I want to know immunizations because if they don't have immunizations, I don't want them in another room with another child because it could be dangerous. I do want to know fevers. You know, when was the last one? What was it? What's the highest? And then when are the medications? Because I need to continue giving medications if they have a fever. What is cystic fibrosis? Now you're going to be doing a case study on cystic fibrosis. So I didn't go in it completely deep here. I'm just hitting you with the key concepts involved with it, okay? There's a couple of questions here on cystic. <clears throat> you know, cystic fibrosis is where the lungs get full of mucus and requires aggressive physical, uh, chest physical therapy. And the small intestines has a really hard time absorbing food. They lose fat vitamins and they require an enzyme to be able to absorb nutrients. These kids are tiny and these kids um, require some supplements of uh, vitamins also. What is the greatest risk for an infant have a cardiac catheterization? Now we mentioned if there's a problem on an echo, they're gonna go right for a cardiac catheterization because we need to determine what exactly is going on with that kid. <clears throat> they take a catheter, put it in the femoral artery and in the femoral vein and it's big. So when they come back from the cath lab, they have gone from the cath lab stretcher to their stretcher or their warmer. And then they in the hall and they're bouncing around and where they have stopped the bleeding in the groin, it might've dislodged a clot. And when they get to you, they could have bled like a lot. So number one thing I do, I'm checking that dressing. Yes, it's a pressure dressing, but it doesn't mean it will not bleed. What happens if you see bleeding? You're going to apply pressure right above where that the entry points are, like closer up to the heart. Put good pressure there. And of course, call for help. Um, but the treatment is put pressure till the clot and the, the blood stops and the clot's there again. Place another pressure dressing and then older children will put a sandbag there, okay? That's the biggest risk, bleeding. Can you imagine how quick an infant could bleed out with these two big holes? Pretty quick. How is cystic fibrosis identified? There is an examination we could take. One of the symptoms of cystic fibrosis in the newborn is no stool in the first two days. And it's something to look at. Look at that, they'll look at thyroid problems. But what we do is called uh, a sweat test. Now, if you were the parent of a child that has been diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, if I told you to lick your child, it would be full of salt. 
you get salt coming out through your sweat and your pores. And that's how they diagnose it. So that being said, are we going to limit salt to these children? No, they need salt in their diet. They also need high calorie formulas because they're not getting all the fat they need. So these children, instead of getting regular formula, we would increase the calorie count in there. A multi-select. What's included in the plan of care for a child with cystic fibrosis? So we got to take care of those lungs. It's full of all of this thick mucus that we need to get out. They're in aggressive respiratory therapy with aerosols and chest physical therapy, chest PT like crazy to keep it open, keep the lungs going. Also, because of their inability to absorb nutrients, they have to take pancreatic enzymes with meals. And because they're losing fat, they're on a high protein diet. It helps replace that. And remember, they're going to be on higher calorie formulas or a supplement into breast milk to give them more calories, but a regular sodium diet because they're losing salt and their sweat, remember? What is a drug of choice for a pharmacological? closure of that patent ductus arteriosus. Remember that PDA is all about oxygen. And we know inside mommy, when they're still pregnant with the baby, mommy produces a hormone called prostaglandins, right? So when we want it closed, we can give a drug that says prostaglandins stop. Stop producing, and then indomethacin does that, and the PDA just closes without surgery. That is what we want to do, no surgery. What is not a feature of tetralogy of Fallot? Well, remember, tetralogy, tet spells, is that pulmonary artery. It's all about right-sided of the heart. It's all on the right side. All has to do with oxygenation. So looking at those, which one's not right-sided? And it's the aortic stenosis is left side. With tetralogy, you're gonna see pulmonary artery stenosis because that's where blood goes to the lungs. We're gonna see that right ventricle when that's closed off, blood doesn't go up, so it stretches that right ventricle. So it causes that ventricular hypertrophy. And then there was a hole um, between them. Another uh, thing of the four parts is the aorta sort of moves over. So they call it an overriding aorta, but it's all about right-sided heart. What medicine would you hold for an infant that is vomiting and vital signs are 99-88-32, TPR. <clears throat> That's digoxin. Now, adults can tell you things, right? Infants can't. You might see them retching like and nauseous. You might see them vomiting and then the heart rate being that low on an infant. Yes, hold the digoxin, call the physician, do a digoxin level. We do the same things for giving digoxin like we do with adults. We're going to do a minute long apical pulse and it has to be above what other physician says. Could be 100, 120, whatever he wants it to be. We're going to check potassium levels and dig levels, okay? If they're vomiting, I would be worried unless you have a recent digoxin level.
They're not going to see yellow halos. They can't tell you, right? But they can vomit for you. Why would a child at Tetralogy of Fallot not gain weight at the normal rate? Again, congenital cyanotic heart disease. That's the inadequate oxygenation, which leads to decreased energy to feed. Therefore, they're going to lose weight. Seen in most cyanotic heart disease. All are examples of cyanotic heart murmurs, except which one? Well, truncus is something that the whole thing's open and it's cyanotic, okay? Think about aortic stenosis. Remember, osis means there's an opening. Therefore, something is flowing. Therefore, it's not that. So that is not cyanotic. The other ones all are. We know tetralogy. I've already said it's the most common. Atresia means no opening at all. Definitely cyanotic. And then truncus, it's just part of the list. It's just something you'd have to look at. I'm not going into the details because I don't want you confused. Tetralogy is the one you need to know and transposition and coarctation. What is the most common cyanotic congenital heart defect? I've said it at least three, four times already. <coughs> And it's Tetralogy of Fallot. Remember, PDA gives oxygen. That has, it's not a heart defect. It's fetal circulation that we can open or close when you don't have oxygen. Tetralogy, most common. Hypoplastic left heart is the most severe of all the defects. And I think those children with nurses become the most near and dear to them because they get at least three stages of surgery and they still never have perfect saturations ever. Nursing care following a cardiac catheterization. So remember they've gone, they have had a hole in their femoral artery, their femoral vein, they come back. You know, of course, we're checking that insertion site for bleeding. That's absolutely. But what else? Well, we're not going to ambulate them. They can't get out of bed for 24 hours. That extremity has to stay straight because bending it could pop the clot off of the femoral artery or vein, okay? And raising the head of bed slowly. They're able to eat. They're able to drink um, if they want to after that. And of course, we'll be checking some dextrous on them just in case, especially the younger kids, in case they didn't get any sort of sugar IV solution during the procedure, because they'll drop their O2 sat, their dex, um, their, their dex levels too low, and we want to give them a little sugar. A multi select nursing education for cardiac catheterization include all except. You wanna monitor the vital signs. We wanna look at their dressing. We're not ambulating this child for 24 hours and we can't bend that extremity. We want to keep it straight. Which information is most important when rheumatic fever is suspected? 
You have this kid who's got these swollen knuckles. You know, their this gait is shuffling. They've got this rash, fever. They, they don't feel good. So when you think rheumatic fever, think strep throat. Have they had strep throat recently? Because how are you going to treat rheumatic fever? Remember, it can also affect usually the mitral valve and cause permanent damage. So we are going to treat it by treating that strep pharyngitis. We're going to give antibiotics for at least a month, if not longer. Signs of shock in children include all the following, except... Hypotension, Hi hypotension, their blood pressures drop, their heart rate goes up, they have poor or prolonged capillary refill, urinary outputs decreased, and they get restless, they have altered mental status, but their blood pressures are on the floor. That is shock, hypotension, not hyper. What's the treatment for Kawasaki disease? Remember, this is systemic vasculitis, inflammation of the vessels. And again, we're worried about those coronary arteries and possibility of having a myocardial infarction because it can happen or it can cause an aneurysm to burst. So only disease that we give aspirin. And what's the aspirin used for? It thins the blood and prevents clots. And then the IVIG to boost the immune system. Which of the following best describes the pathophysiology of Kawasaki disease? <clears throat> I just said it. Multi-system vasculitis, which may affect the coronary arteries. It's about those vessels getting inflamed and causing inflammation in there and a microembolus going on. A multi-select. A clinical manifestation of Kawasaki disease is what? What do you see? <clears throat> Again, it's blistered or um, even some swelling, um, boily type of blisters and cracked hands and soles of feet. Those eyes are glow in the dark red. That's how distinguishable. Strawberry tongue, dry lips, and there's a rash, but it's not this, this type of rash. It's more of that little popular macular rash, not these big demarcations. Which of the following is the most common cause of shock in infants and children? <clears throat> Remember children, infants, you know, what do we know? They've got these very brittle immune systems because they're not built yet. Infection is what the biggest thing of shock in the infants and children. What are the defects associated with tetralogy of Fallot? Remember, right side. Remember I told you it's four different things. And it's that pulmonary artery stenosis. The pulmonary artery somehow kinks off, doesn't allow blood up. There's a hole in that septum between the ventricles, the aorta pulls over, 
and that right ventricle can get a little bit stretched or that's also called hypertrophy. A young child with tetralogia flow may assume which position naturally when they're having a tet spell. And I think that picture is perfect. And it is, they squat. It's like they could feel it and they squat and they do. They change the pressures in their abdomen and chest and they actually get themselves, you know, oxygenating again. Transposition of the great arteries is, what are the great arteries of a heart? So when you talk about transposition of the great arteries, the pulmonary artery and aorta are switched. This is a type of diagnosis where there's no oxygen going on. This diagnosis needs prostaglandins. We need oxygen, right? You need oxygen, where do you go? PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. Which of the following is not an intervention indicated for transposition of the great arteries? Well, we know we need to give prostaglandins to get oxygen. Sometimes they'll make a hole between the atrium. You know, there's that patent foraminal valley at birth, right? There's a tiny little hole in the atrium. Well, they punch a hole through that, make it bigger. So you're changing the right and left side and getting a little bit of blood flowing with oxygen in there. And then the surgery, its name is called arterial switch operation. You switch the arteries. Oral, nothing is going to help this child. We need more intravenously and more sort of interventions. A multi-select. Why is prostaglandins given to a child with transposition of the great arteries? What does prostaglandins do? I know you know one of these for sure. <clears throat> Do you see that little box there? That is a temporary pacemaker that is used in children. And those little blue things, those wires were pacer wires. Now, prostaglandins gives oxygen. That's number one, but it helps with cardiac output, number two. It is both of those, very important concept. What is the purpose of giving indomethacin to a neonate with a patent ductus arteriosus? What does indomethacin do to that PDA? Remember there's prostaglandins and there's indomethacin. What's the difference? So, as I said, to keep the duct open, you have to have prostaglandins in there, right? So endomethacin says, no prostaglandins, stop, go away. And then the duct closes by itself with a medicine, endomethacin. And it's really just an NSAID. It really is. There's actually a pill used years ago. It used to be used for back pain. It's like an ibuprofen sort of thing, but it's really an old, old drug. I was shocked when I saw that. And we know it's oxygen has to go to the body. So it connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery because it puts oxygen to the body so the body gets it. This heart defect allows blood to pass from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. How's that possible? What's it called?
And that's a ventricular septal defect. The septum is what takes away the right and left side. It holds them separate, whether it's on the top portions, atrial septal, or the bottom ventricular septal defect. Remember, if there's a hole in either the atrial or ventricular septum, blood's coming back and going back into the lungs, okay? So it's just recirculating oxygenated blood back. So we want to close that to make the heart work less. I'll multi-select. What is a sign of dig toxicity in infants? So if you're an infant, what would you see? Well, you might see that retching and you'll see vomiting and you'll see a low heart rate. Infection has nothing to do with digoxin. And when's the last time an infant told you they saw yellow spots? <laughs> it's not gonna happen. That's the adults. You'd only see that vomiting and heart rate in infants, nothing else. What is congestive heart failure? <clears throat> you know, does it matter if I ask congestive heart failure in an adult or a child? No, it's just the heart is weak and it can't squeeze all the blood out. So it fills the lungs up. How do we treat it? Diuretics and something to strengthen the heart. Furosemide, digoxin. How do we monitor it? Strict intake and output, and we'll be monitoring um, daily weights. And we can see it occurring because that urine output decreases. So that fluid's going somewhere, and then the weights will be going up too. Why are they gaining weight? Well, it's fluid. Left-sided congestive heart failure causes. <clears throat> It's left-sided, it goes back up into the lung, shortness of breath, fluid, and coughing. Yes, very good. After a heart transplant, what is the leading reason children die? And it's rejection. Rejection is the reason, not infection, it's rejection. A multi-select. Signs and symptoms of rheumatic fever include. Everything. Korea is that movement where they're unsteady on their feet and shuffling and falling over. Sometimes that is the reason why they go to the doctor and then they find them with polyarthritis, that subcutaneous nodules, rash, fever. And they're like, ah, oh, what is rheumatic fever? A strep infection not treated. How do we treat it? Antibiotics for at least a month, if not two. A multi-select. A child's about to have a chest tube removed. What should you do? You know, I worked in adults and I worked in pediatrics in open heart areas. And the adults told me when you pull those chest tubes out, it burns, it hurts. It's not a long period of time, maybe 15 seconds, it hurts. So let them know on their understanding be honest, tell them it's gonna hurt, but you do everything to help them. You're not gonna put them supine. You're gonna elevate the head of their bed. It's better to breathe when chest tubes come out, right? And of course, 
number one, medicate them for pain. And you will be monitoring vital signs before and after because you're giving pain medicine. A child just had abdominal surgery, can't cough well enough to expectorate secretions. What is a nurse's priority? You need them to cough. You don't want any atelectasis in the lungs. You don't want side effects. How are you gonna do that? Number one, you're gonna medicate them with pain. If you medicate them with pain, they'll get out of bed, they'll move around, they'll use instead of spirometry. But number one, give them pain medicine. That's first. An infant of three months have a fever of 103.6. What would you medicate the infant with? <coughs> only Tylenol. For the first six months of life, only acetaminophen is given to an infant. After six months, you may give the ibuprofen, the Motrin. There's something with platelet aggregation and the young infant, they don't tolerate it. Only acetaminophen until six months old. A newborn infant is assessed and the nurse finds very weak lower extremity pulses. What should she assess next? What do you think is going on? There's no pulses or maybe a little pulses in the feet. And you know, in my lifetime, I found one of these. So it's probably coarctation, right? How can you determine that? Look at the blood pressures. In coarctation, the lower extremities with barely any pulses should have a lower blood pressure, at least 20 millimeters of mercury. And the upper is gonna have more blood flow, higher blood pressures, okay? And then we could, hey doc, this kid I think is coarctation. A multi-select. A critically ill child is on complete bed rest. What can a nurse do to prevent complications? And it doesn't matter a child, an adult, you know, they're critically ill, they can't get out of bed, you're always trying to prevent complications. We want to keep their lungs moving. So instead of spirometry, keep them clean and dry, diapers, chucks, whatever we have to do. And in infants and children, we use pillows and blankets to keep them up and over because they like to wiggle down. So we try to keep them where they need to go. And if we can, elevate the head of the bed because it opens the lung expansion. Good. How can oxygen be delivered that's easiest tolerated and accurately monitored for infants? You know, we're talking about these cardiac cyanotic problems. You know, many of them are going to get oxygen or a little bit of oxygen. What's the best way? Oxyhood, because it's clear, they can see, they can put their fingers, there's nothing taped or blown in their nose. Very good. A multi select. What procedure are used to keep the lungs open with a child with cystic? Fibrosis. You know, I call cystic fibrosis in the lungs. It's like their lungs are these petri dishes that are waiting for bacteria to grow in there. It's how thick and dense those secretions are. So, just physical therapy, absolutely. Deep breathing and coughing and exercise, ambulating PRN. No, ambulating a lot, morning, noon, and after, you know, evening, they need to be ambulating up and moving, just not BRN, more than that. A multi-select. Children with cystic fibrosis require pancreatic enzyme with meals. What teaching should be done to these parents and to the children?
So we give them right before the meals, not an hour before, not two hours, right before. Sometimes we have to open the capsule and sprinkle it, which is fine. But sometimes if it's powder, we need to make sure we rinse the mouth so that it doesn't hurt their teeth. And remember, children grow. We forget that and they need bigger doses as they get older. What is a cardiac defect where there's no valve between the right atrium and right ventricle? What is the word that I use for nothing there? And that's tricuspid atresia. Remember A, without, nothing. And tricuspid valve is between the right atrium and right ventricle, okay? Again, look at the anatomy and blood flow through the heart. When an infant is breathing fast, tires easily and needs rest periods during feeding, what should you assess? What's going on, do you think? Breathing fast, tiring easily. Probably they're going into congestive heart failure. So check their breath sounds. Okay, we did it, guys. Number three, Yanny. Good job, Yanny. Number two, Megan. Megan. Number one, CJ. Number four, Ashley and Amber. Good job, guys. I mean, I know that's a hard one. What I want you to do is sign... Your attendance attestations, make sure they get done. Any questions or you need help with this week, please just let me know. Send me a message. If you want to review your exams, send me a message and I'll review them, okay? There was 200s in this class, the only class. You guys did good, good job. You are a great class, so thank you so much. Thanks for your patience with my voice. I'm sorry it's squeaky, but well, I tried thank hard. You. <laughs> Have a good yeah, night, thank guys. You, professor, feel thank better. You. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, Take care. professor, really quick. Yes. When you have a chance, I want you to explain again, not today because I know you feel sick, the tetralogy and PDA. Okay. Send me a message. We'll do it together. Okay. Thank you. Or remind me the beginning of next class. We'll do it again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good job. Good night. Good night. Good night.